Hello, good morning. I am Antonio Bicchi. It's a pleasure to be in this workshop. And uh, I will try to give you my views on impedance control in robots and in humans and how we can uh, plan it or how we can learn to use it in a way that uh, helps doing what we want to do. Uh, let me share my screen and uh, start with uh, some considerations on what uh, uh, we have uh, in mind for this talk. First of all, I'm with the University of Pisa and the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia in Genova. And I uh, will uh, begin discussing how compliance is ubiquitous in nature. It is for both uh, dexterity, you see here uh, the trunk of, a, of a, an elephant or uh, a snake, uh, it's for efficiency uh, in uh, because of energy efficiency. It is for resilience, like in this uh, video from boxers. Uh, this is uh, part of the of the story because uh, if you go through all nature revolution, uh, compliance is always there. All animals are more soft, and uh, this is because it gives versatility for different application tolerance to errors and imprecisions gives safety to their motion uh, robustness during the interaction with the environment and with other animals energy efficiency better performance not only we have uh, all animals but also many robots that have been inspired to animals have such compliance or softness so um First of all, where does compliance or stiffness come from? In the humans, uh, all articulations are, arti are um, actuated by at least uh, two actuators, uh, the muscles. And muscles are characterized by a force deformation curve or a force velocity curve and a force motor neuron fire rate curve. There are different models. Uh, Gribble models, for instance, shows that uh, activation enters exponentially and that uh, the force is a nonlinear function of both the activation and the elongation. It is still an open topic in literature to have an effective model, but here is a, a reasonable model uh, that comes out of uh, combining the actions of agonistic and antagonistic muscles around the joint. Of course, the lever arm of these muscles also acts to change the stiffness resulting from the uh, contraction of the agonist and antagonist. Um, of course, when we apply forces in one direction because of the nonlinearity of the muscles, the um, stiffness of the joint itself changes. And uh, this is an effect that is due to two factors. One is uh, not intentional. There is uh, a nonlinearity in the muscle structure that um, makes them stiffer when they are uh, acting more forces. But also uh, there are some co-contractions that, that appear here. You see the green EMG is uh, activated when uh, sustaining a larger load more than in normal conditions, which is a bit counterintuitive. Uh, so stiffness changes in our muscles, both voluntarily and involuntarily. Indeed, you can also change uh, the stiffness of, an, of uh, your arm, of your biceps and triceps, uh, by co-contracting, basically co-activating these muscles. So you can change the stiffness if you want to, uh, to achieve adapting to adaptation to different tasks, for instance. It has been shown that uh, humans can learn after many repeated trials to change their stiffness profile along a given learned path. There are a few uh, famous papers, uh, Professor Bourdais has given already a talk on this, uh, including this topic. And uh, you see here the apparatus, the, um, the robot that was used to perturb the human position along given trajectories. And the uh, experiments show that when a diverging force field was applied to the trajectories of the human, in order for the human to be able to uh, 
keep going in the, in the, in the right direction, after a few trials, the human would learn how to stiffen the robot in the direction perpendicular to the disturbance field, force field, and then uh, be more accurate. Uh, these uh, experiments show that there is um, a good degree of intentionality, but the amount of change in the stiffness uh, ellipsoid direction is limited. Indeed, there are other results that show that uh, to a first approximation, humans do not really do that. Um, it is apparent that humans rather control the stiffener ellipsoid more simply. The posture of the arm seems to dominate the shape of the ellipsoid and the co-activation of the muscles seem to control the volume independent of the shape. So in uh, uh, a possible uh, term for this has been uh, proposed as a configuration dependent stiffness that changes with postures and gives the shape of the stiffness ellipsoid, uh, exploiting the redundancy of the arm that, uh, or the limb that can change their, their, their stiffness thanks to its uh, different uh, leverage. And uh, common mode stiffness that instead keeps configuration fixed, but changes with co-contraction. And that gives the size of the ellipsoid. Basically, when you stiffen up, you keep the same directions of the principal axis of the stiffness ellipsoid, but you change their size. And you make it stiffer or softer in the same main directions. This has been validated in some work that Rasha Judani, uh, myself and co-workers have done uh, a few years ago. And uh, it has been validated through uh, an experimental uh, validation setup where the robot was used as a shaker for the human arm. And in different configurations of the arm, you could see that when stiffening up, when asking the person to stiffen up his arm, then you will see that there is a strong correlation between the volume of the ellipsoid and the level of uh, co-activation. And also you can see that in different configurations, the ellipsoid shape that was measured was kept relatively constant while its size was changed, dominated by the co-contraction. Now, these lessons learned in humans have been used in robots since uh, quite some time. There are two ways of realizing variable stiffness or variable impedance in robots. One is to use uh, software, basically with what we call uh, impedance control. And one is through hardware, making actuators that inherently, passively, physically can change their impedance. The second uh, type of actuators, uh, the variable stiffness actuators, or variable impedance actuators are more directly inspired by nature. As I mentioned before, in nature, we change uh, our stiffness by co-activating and in a robot, we can do a similar thing. So for instance, here is some work that uh, we did a few years ago in uh, 2011 to propose a, a, a variable stiffness actuator in the uh, modular shape of a cube that uh, mechanically uh, replicated the same or very similar curves to what uh, um, you can use in humans, thereby providing a, a very um, useful counterpart for making experiments on how um, the uh, impedance could be used for robots. Here are a few more examples of the use of hardware uh, variable impedance. Um, you see the work of uh, the group of uh, Professor Lefebvre in Brussels and Bram van der Boort, who pr produced a lower extremity exoskeleton with variable stiffness of using a device called Makepa. And you also see here a, uh, one of those VSA cubes that uh, was used for an exoskeleton more recently uh, by Sariam Gams, one of our students. A few years ago, we tried to control an exoskeleton through variable impedance uh, in this work with a person that could lift himself using one single leg, which is not an obvious task to do, uh, 
thanks to the help from a, um, an exoskeleton knee. Uh, in this case, why variable impedance? Because you need a stronger or stiffer help from the robot in the phases where you have to exert more forces. Why, why you, when you're standing, of course, you would like the exoskeleton to be minimum stiffness, maximum compliance to let your motion free. What we did in this example was very simply to take inputs from the muscles of the leg that was trying to uh, control the standing up and uh, replicate that stiffness along with the impulse of intention of motion into the control of the uh, variable stiffness actuator. Therefore, we obtain this rather effective help. Variable stiffness actuators can be used also for prosthetics. And uh, in uh, recent projects, we are uh, investigating how to make, for instance, a variable stiffness elbow uh, using either an explicit stiffness variation or an antagonistic setup in a device that is uh, going to come soon. Here are the effects of the variable stiffness uh, actuation on an elbow that was developed by my student, uh, Simon Lemaire. And uh, you can see how different uh, um, is the behavior in dampening the um, impacts with the environment. This is ongoing work, of course. Let me now tackle the second possible avenue to controlling variable impedance, which is via software. It is well known that a robot has uh, dynamics and has an influence of the external forces that goes through the Jacobian. So if you uh, act uh, on the control side, you can modify the torques at the joints based on the discrepancy of the endpoint position from a reference so that the robot really behaves as an impedance in a workspace. That is a well-known result by uh, several different uh, authors. And you can see that it can be implemented and it is today implemented in practice in many devices, including here, for instance, some from FANUC, some from uh, Franca Amica or Universal Robot. It is very easily configurable, precise and compliant. Uh, of course, it is not as resilient or energy efficient as a physical variable stiffness, but um, in many cases, it's very useful. There is something I would like to discuss with you, to share with you, um, which is a kind of a paradox. So if you think of a robot in different configurations, because of the impedance control scheme that we just discussed, you can easily see that a given stiffness ellipsoid could be reached in any configuration. So in theory, a robot can attain arbitrary stiffness ellipsoids in any posture. So uh, why should humans change their posture to be rigid against the wall as in the right or compliant as in the left picture? Well, that comes from the fact that in reality, the hypotheses that are behind the uh, possibility of having arbitrary stiffness ellipsoids are, do not hold. In reality, we have limits on our muscle forces. We have limits on our actuator, robot actuator forces. So if you see on the left of this uh, picture, you see that when you control the two configurations A and B, on the top of the page, then your uh, forces are very different. And if there are saturations in the control, you see that some of the forces will go uh, to the saturation bound. Therefore, the ellipsoid will not look uh, really like they do in theory. Rather, there will be polytopes in the torque space that are mapped into stranger shapes, into the stiffness space. And here are drafts of what results of the original stiffness ellipsoid. So the point really is that you want to choose the configuration such that the mapped polytope 
matches best the shape of the desired ellipsoid for your task. And that is something that dictates the postures where a, a robot should be placed in order to achieve some desired behavior, taking into consideration the intrinsic limits that we have. And here is an example, for instance, of the same robots trying to achieve a stiffer or softer position, right and left here, that are um, somehow corresponding to those of the human above. Of course, these are not the same configurations because the robots has a different kinematic, so there are different configurations of the robots that achieve stiffer or softer behaviors, but the concept remains that the configuration is very important for the deciding the impedance of a robot. Now that we have the possibility of implementing uh, variable impedance either in hardware or software, doesn't really matter, how do we use? And that is a question that has been around and still is around, and I think it's at the core of this uh, workshop. How do we use it? We all think, we all believe that it is important to have variable impedance. Humans have variable impedance, humans exploit variable impedance, in robots, it's not always obvious what can we do with variable impedance. At the end of the day, variable impedance implies more complexity in software or in hardware, and it has to pay for uh, its existence. There are three possible ways to exploit variable impedance. One is optimal planning, one is under human control, and the third that I will talk about is learning from humans. So let's first consider optimal planning. There are many different things that you may want to do with robots. One, for instance, is minimize impact. And to minimize impact, um, you want to minimize impact, for instance, for keeping safety under control. Here are videos that have been made uh, in collaboration uh, between DLR in Germany and uh, our group that show how the impact of a robot can be very harsh. In some cases though, by introducing compliance, you can reduce these, uh, the danger of impacts. So for instance, uh, uh, to uh, introduce compliance between the rotor inertia and the link, as in a classical compl variable compliant uh, variable softness uh, robot, you can uh, pose yourself uh, a optimization problem. And this is something that we did uh, uh, several years ago in uh, already uh, almost uh, 20 years ago. Uh, you ask yourself, well, if I want to move from A to B and I want to move fast because in robotics, typically you want to move fast, I have uh, uh, risks with that motion. I can put though a variable impedance between the rotor inertia and the link inertia, and I can decide whether to make it stiffer or softer. What is the best impedance in different phases of the motion? If you cast it as an optimal control problem, we call it the safe brachistochrome problem, it's the smallest time under given guarantees of uh, safety any time. Then you have to decide both the actuation force and the variable stiffness. And what turns out to be interesting is that the optimal policy that you can find is that um, when you move slowly, it is convenient to be stiff. While when you move fast, you better be soft to minimize the danger. So out of these uh, simple optimization routines, we came out with this uh, idea of uh, fast and soft, stiff and slow, which is um, uh, the optimal policy to go from A to B in minimum time with guaranteed bounds of safety. But there are other goals that you may ask to your robot. For instance, you want to maximize performance maximize velocity at the end of the swing of a hammer to uh, maximize impact and uh, put a nail down as fast as possible. 
So if you study the optimal control for this problem, again, you realize that the optimal control is that you should be stiff when the velocity and acceleration of the arm are in the same direction and the same sign, while you should be soft when they have different signs. So when you, uh, when you accelerate, you want to be stiff to put as much energy as you can in the given time into the system. And then when you decelerate in the phases where the hammer is going back before slamming the nail, then you want to be soft to maximize the uh, uh, storage of energy. So this is another lesson that you can get easily from analytical optimal control. And we call it soft speed up, soft slow down. Here are examples of how the robot controlled with this optimal policy on the right achieves a much faster, uh, much uh, longer turning of the, of the object. Let me show that again, just for your uh, convenience. So you see that uh, just simply changing this policy with the very same hardware can achieve a much higher impact. Of course, sometimes you want to do a completely different thing. You want to maximize damping. And that in that case, it turns out that you solve again the optimal control problem and you learn that the optimal control here is uh, soft when speeding up and steep when slowing down, which is exactly the opposite as before. Of course, the, the, the task now is to damp the oscillations of the pendulum in the minimum time possible to maximize, therefore, the dissipation of energy. As I said before, we have ideas that the poses of the uh, robot change their grasp stiffness, their, sorry, their um, impedance and stiffness. So in some work uh, um, for using robots, you can optimize the stiffness to achieve uh, behaviors. So this uh, uh, configuration dependent stiffness can be used, for instance, for having a stiffer or softer behavior in different directions during tasks that are uh, that require different uh, impedances, as, such as, for instance, the classical pegging hole task. But there are other tasks where you also want to choose the right impedance because it is important and uh, humans do change impedance. So for instance, think of a task of pushing against an environment when you push against an environment, of course, the problem depends on the compliance of the environment, but assume that the uh, environment has a given compliance, assume that it is stiff, for instance, and assume that uh, it has different curvatures. When you press against a, uh, uh, an environment with a given curvature, then you might have the problem that the robot could uh, uh, slip out of the center of this uh, pressure. And there, uh, therefore, you want to be stable against those uh, possible instabilities. Uh, so you want to uh, avoid instability, you want to have resilience, you want to minimize the force that uh, are needed to achieve the task, and you want to minimize the errors of positioning. So you have basically, again, the task is uh, the robot has to press against the environment with a given force by a contact of two curved surfaces, one on the robot and one on the environment. There are stiffness bounds that we realize that are related to uncertainties, to the surface uh, curvature and the contact and the interaction forces. And a work by uh, Ricardo Vengacci, a student in our group, has shown that uh, if you um, try to press, for instance, this panic button with uh, uh, an arm that has a given curvature, then you can easily end up in instabilities if your impedance is uh, too low or incur in excessive forces if your impedance is too high. So in the two, uh, in the first row, you see a software uh, implementation of uh, the um, in variable impedance on a conventional robot arm. 
And in the lower uh, row, you see a hardware implementation of variable impedance, but they are to the same effect. And on the left, you see the results that Ricardo Tengachi has found on the bounds for the stiffness of the arm in the direction of uh, uh, force application that guarantee uh, stability and limit the damage. I will not go into the detail. Another very interesting uh, uh, application of variable stiffness is when uh, uh, robots interact with an environment. Uh, for instance, with an environment where uh, there are unstructured obstacles. And the application that uh, Franco Angelini and co-workers with Seto Vijay Kumar um, did uh, when uh, visiting in Edinburgh a few months ago was that uh, uh, they control the uh, animal robot in walking uh, when the robot uh, hits an unperceived obstacle. So there are two uh, videos here showing that uh, the robot can move with uh, a high impedance, a fixed high impedance, or with a uh, variable impedance. And as you can see, when the hit occurs, the fixed high impedance has uh, larger forces that uh, take the robot to failure, while the variable impedance allows the robot to comply with the environment and get by with uh, the impact. So one of the possibilities to use uh, variable impedance is through optimal control. A second one is through human control. That, that is uh, something that we also call teleimpedance. Now, the idea is basically that the robot is teleoperated, not only in position, but also in stiffness. And it's a very simple idea that Arash Ajudani brought to uh, a very um, uh, complete uh, point of understanding. You see here how uh, the arm gives a reference to the robot, but the different uh, stiffness that he controls through his uh, muscle contraction levels changes the gain of the robot itself so that when it stiffens up also the robot gets uh, more forcefully against the sponge. So this was the idea that we started a few years ago and it has interesting applications for instance if you want to maximize damping and uh, get a ball, a rigid ball into a rigid plate, dissipating the energy of the ball optimally, you can simply um, have a human control it. Another very interesting uh, video is here of the robot telecontrol to put a peg in it uh, in the hole. You can see here how the reference of position is followed by the robot closely when the arm is stiff. Not so when the arm is soft. So to get the peg out of the hole again, the person has to stiffen up and take it away. So in this case, the stiffening or softening of the human arm was mapped to the stiffening and softening of the, of the robot arm in different directions and allowed the execution of a difficult task such as a peg in a hole. In that case, the first examples were using a mapping of the whole ellipsoid, but later on, uh, we realized that there are uh, different ways of control or simpler ways of controlling impedance and that the composition between the common mode stiffness and the configuration dependent stiffness that I mentioned before can be very useful to achieve an even better um, or at least simpler and more stable control of tail impedance. So basically uh, with uh, this uh, modified tail impedance scheme, you can uh, still take the position of the arm and the MGs from uh, few muscles, not all of them, and then determine the position of the robot by imposing a configuration that selects the uh, uh, shape of the ellipsoid in different directions and the co-contraction of the human to make it softer or stiffer, stiffer uh, 
um, making that means the ellipsoid larger or smaller by co-contraction. And here is an example of this uh, second uh, mode of field impedance, where you can see that the robot, when required to do a stiffer task, uh, the Arash uh, shown here is uh, stiffening up his arm and the robot is changing its configuration because it needs a larger stiffness in that direction. These ideas of using uh, human inputs to control the stiffness of the robot have been uh, used also in prosthetics. Um, recently, we controlled uh, process, we started uh, controlling processes, in particular hand processes, uh, with this variable impedance control uh, via software. So that is uh, independent from the specific hardware that we do. And Patricia Capsi did some preliminary, very interesting work on uh, merging the position intention and the stiffness intention in the control of uh, hand processes. Uh, we want to have a natural behavior of muscle stiffness variability and to decode the intention of the human. Uh, we want to promote naturalness and intuitiveness. So it is uh, um, interesting to see how different uh, policies bring to a, a better uh, interaction with the environment. So for instance, the, the person here, the subject could uh, uh, stiffen up the hand and resist to disturbances by co-contracting hair muscles uh, so that to control a stiffer control of the hand or uh, and that could also be used and has been tested in social interactions with, uh, with people, uh, which is another role of uh, variable impedance that is very important in handshaking, for instance, in passing objects, walking hand in hand. And we are now working with Patricia and others, uh, uh, co-workers, to see how this uh, variable impedance control of uh, prosthetic hands is received by uh, subjects that are prosthesis users with some preliminary encouraging results. So the final part of my talk is about uh, learning the impedance control that uh, humans demonstrate to, to robots. So the uh, idea here is that uh, we are moving towards systems and robots that can be used by everybody. Uh, that is a long-term <clears throat> long uh, vision that we have and robots to be useful to humans have to be usable, easily usable. And from uh, industrial robots, we are moving to robots for all and that will be possible only when er everybody will be able to program a robot. Now, everybody is not a programmer. Not everybody can write code. So we have to be able to teach robots to be used without, um, without being able to code. So in the past, uh, only uh, skilled programmers could program a robot. Today, uh, the programming languages are becoming more and more easy to use. So insiders can do that. But we want to have those used by everybody, our uncles, our needs. So the future will have everybody using a robot. Now, how do we teach a robot to do things without explicitly coding? Of course, there are phases of teaching, learning and execution that you can do with a multitude of robots showing uh, uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of examples and trying to abstract uh, through uh, deep learning these rules. But uh, this doesn't really scale up uh, from if you move from a, a few objects in a box to the case of uh, the millions of different objects in the million of different environments, that is uh, very hard to do. Another possibility that we are exploring is uh, in more inspired from the way kids and babies learn to manipulate. So the idea here is that we want to 
uh, teach a robot to uh, do things without coding by simply demonstrating once or at most few times how to do things. And uh, the setup is here. There is a person that uh, shows the robot what to do and the robot that is there to learn. The robot has a similar appearance to the human so that it's very intuitive for the human to move it around. The human wears um, very simple devices that are shown here. These uh, devices are basically only position uh, devices for the hands, uh, a, a visor for uh, seeing the scene in 3D and EMG measurements on the person heart. Now here is the first video where the person sees this scene from the Doom, from the robot head and tells the robot that this uh, tape roll should be placed on this holder. Once he has done that, the robot should be able, as any kid would do, to understand that the tape roll, wherever it is, goes onto the holder. Oh, so far, so good. The robot only generalizes the position. But then, if the robot holder is there, uh, is moved, and uh, there are two tapes, why shouldn't the robot do the same again? So this is easy to do to the robot. Um, but of course, there is no impedance considered so far, but it's just to show the idea. So the robot now is uh, confronted with objects he's never seen before. And therefore, the, uh, Gianluca is showing again that uh, glue bottles go in the yellow holders and that the brass connectors go in the blue box. So now that you have that, the, Lord, the robot can generalize. It sees a new yellow box free and places the glue and the brass goes at the right place. Of course, the robot already knows what to do of tape rolls. And while he is there, it finishes the job. That is uh, something that we have done um, in recent work by Gianluca Lentini and co-workers. It's also interesting that uh, once you have this uh, learned, you can do that faster and you can do any time. So this is uh, accelerated motion, it's not an accelerated video, it's the robot that pe performs twice the velocity uh, at which it learned. But coming back to uh, impedance now, what is uh, um, that you can do with this teaching scheme when you want to do a task that involves interaction, that involves contact, and therefore involves control of forces? Well, you can try to teach a robot that is stiff in teleoperation. And of course, you can achieve a successful demonstration but when you try to replicate that autonomously, the robot follows the same position and has uh, still a stiff behavior so that in the end, the force will grow and prevent the execution, autonomous execution of the task with a very high end force that is not desirable. You could either control the robot to be soft during the execution of the task, and still you can teach the robot directly when the robot is in, when the human is in charge of the robot, it succeeds in doing the task. As you can see here. But then when you try to execute what happens, is that the robot execution, the autonomous execution will not be perfect because of course positions may have changed. And there being soft, it will end up with a large tracking error of the reference and it will never accomplish the task. So if you modify the scheme that we have seen before and you try to teach the robot also the right impedance to use, then you can use the uh, measurement of the stiffness of the human through the EMGs on the 
arm of the of the pilot and uh, measure it along the way. So what you will see is that now the, the robot is controlled in variable impedance and the human changes its in, his impedance while doing the task. Of course, in teaching, everything works fine. And when you replicate autonomously, you see that also the autonomous execution is successful because the force is following the right force and the position is following the, the right position. But that's because the impedance has been matched. And as you can see here, also in the first phase, you have a stiff positioning of the robot arm that follows the references. Then you have a phase where you have a soft robot according to the uh, lesson taught by the human. And finally, you're stiff again to place the peg down into the hole. So with this, I will conclude my talk. These were very recent results <clears throat> that uh, Gianluca Lentini is uh, bringing forward with some take home messages. First of all, we have seen human impedance. Human impedance changes both among tasks and within a single task, we do change our impedance. Part of the variability of impedance is indeed intentional and we use it to perform better. Uh, impedance variations in humans are controlled both by muscle co-activation and by changing the arm posture using the redundancy of the arm. When it goes to robots, robot impedance can be varied by both software and hardware means. Impedance can be controlled by both varying the gains in software or the hardware stiffness in um, variable stiffness actuators and also through changing the arm posture. We have finally seen that planning of variable impedance to exploit it can use insight from optimization. Uh, on the other hand, we have also seen that humans can profitably control variable impedance if they are given a chance of uh, uh, using tail operation and using uh, the concept of tail impedance. And finally, we have shown some work that uh, um, hints at the fact that we the robots can learn impedance behavior from very few human examples. So that opens a path to the future and uh, I hope that uh, it will be profitable for everybody. Thank you uh, for your attention and uh, have a good day.